Hi, I'm Adam Lissigore. I'm the founder of Sandwich in Los Angeles, and you're listening to The Go Creative Show. Hey, everyone. My name is Ben Consoli. I'm a director and owner of BC Media Productions, and this is The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. Now, on today's show, we have a discussion with Adam Lissigore. Now, you may not know his name, but you certainly know his face. And the reason why is because when he began his uh, video production company, Sandwich Video, back in the day, he ended up starring in a bunch of his own projects. And basically by doing that, became kind of the new face of video advertising and completely changed the way that production companies operate and completely changed the value and the the impact that video production companies can have for their clients. He changed our world. And the discussion that we're having today is all about what he's done with his company, Sandwich, um, his early days, how he grew the company, where it is today, where the future is going to go in video production and particularly virtual production, and also a huge discussion about working with clients. So if you are a owner of a production company, thinking about owning one or starting one of your own, or just, you know, Go creative show audience, freelancers, creative people. This is an episode you do not want to miss because everything in here is going to be valuable for you. And I am so excited to share this interview with all of you guys. So before we jump into our interview with Adam, I want to mention two offers for our Go Creative Show audience. One is from OpenReel. Now, OpenReel is the program that I use to do my um, remote iPhone filmmaking, and uh, it's an unbelievable platform. And you can get 10% off simply by telling them my name or Go Creative Show when you purchase. So go to openreel.com, set up a demo, check it out for yourself, and let them know you heard about them from us, and you'll get 10% off. And Soundstripe will give you 15% off of a monthly or annual plan. Go to gocreativeshow.com forward slash Soundstripe and use the code gocreativeshow15 for 15% off a monthly or annual plan. So there you go, some savings for you guys. All right, none of that nonsense. Let's get right to our interview with Adam Lissigore, the founder of Sandwich. So I'm here with Adam Lissigore, the founder of Sandwich, formerly Sandwich Video, and that's Mm -hmm. because they are expanding and growing and changing right before our very eyes, and I'm so excited to have Adam on the show to talk all about it. Welcome. Welcome. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much, Ben. Sandwich has been a giant inspiration for me. Like your work is so good. And I look to you guys as like the pinnacle of what a production company can be in our kind of new post DSLR world. I I just feel like you guys have nailed it. And for the people that may not know who you are personally or your company, You've definitely seen Adam's work, and uh, we're going to put a link to anything we talk about in the show notes, as we always do, and of course, a link to your website, um, because you've definitely seen these ads, and uh, Mm -hmm. I've just, I'm so inspired by what you've done with Sandwich, and can't wait to to dive into it. I'm um, excited to talk to you, and if you want to just go on complimenting me for the next 45 minutes, I'm game for that, too. No, that's all you but get. Yeah, like you people... just get the beginning, and then we, then we go to the okay. hard-kidding questions. It's Who are you voting down, for? Quick. No, for... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mask or no mask? Still Tell undecided. me, quick. <laughs> <laughs> all right. If you want to talk politics, I'm, I can talk politics. Oh, my no, God. No, I mean, like, I, it's hard to know anymore what whether people are aware of who who I am or who's what sandwich is. I'm always surprised to hear because I was listening to episodes of your show. My friend Tyler Stallman was on as a guest and, you know, about, about 15 minutes in, he dropped my name and, and I was like, yes, nice Tyler go. And then when you said, oh yeah, I know who sandwich is. That's when it, it's, that's when it always blows my mind that anybody out, out there who I haven't connected with personally knows who we are, the work that we do. Um, but yeah, I mean, early on, early on, I was on camera a lot for the work that we did and probably most commonly people would possibly recognize me as like the true car guy, the, the, on the true car commercials where I wore these glasses and I would, I'd be like, let's say you want to buy a car. And, and like, those were just, you, those 
those commercials were omnipresent for like a f- like five years in sports bars and um, gyms yeah. ac- and grandparents' houses across the nation. What? How did you make the decision to put yourself front and center in these ads? Ego. I mean, like, I just love myself and my own image so much that I figure this is my chance, right? Um, no, that's not the thing at all. Uh, it's actually probably the opposite. We, in the case of True Car, we tried to cast a spokesperson when they brought us on um, to as an agency, and nobody was really striking the right tone for them. And they, you know, True Car came to us sandwich because they liked our work, and they liked the way we told stories, you know, visually and graphically and sort of explained product. Um, but they also, it turns out, liked my own character persona. And so at some point in the casting process when nothing was really hitting, they said, here's an idea. How about you do it? And at that point, it was just a web spot. It was just a 90-second wow. explain what True Car means in a technology, you know, format. And... Um, and when that went really well, then they, then we cut them, that, we cut that first one down to a 30 second spot. It performed well. And then, you know, I was doing that character for the next five years, but it's not, I love it when people kind of make an assumption that it's because I cast myself <laughs> because of a need to be, uh, seen in the, in the pu- public, uh, you know, in public consciousness, because it's not that it's, um, you know, sometimes the way it started was that I didn't really feel comfortable directing actors and I didn't know even the casting process. Um, so when it, when it was the first few or the first one really, which was my own app that I was doing a video for, it was just me in my backyard with no crew. And I just thought I can explain how this works better than, than, than anybody else can because it's my product and I want people to know how, what it is, what it's for. And you're talking about the Birdhouse app video back in 2009. That's right. Thank you. And it was a creative writing app for Twitter, which was complete nonsense. No reason for that very niche app to exist. But it, the fact that I was there to explain it helped sort of tell a story in a way that the tech story hadn't been told before. Um, and then really, it was just that my clients started asking me to be in their videos as well. Um, and it even got to the point and this was like my big missed, my, 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 my white whale was that very early on in that career trajectory of being on camera, um, uh, Apple had got on the phone with me and asked me if I, you know, basically sort of surreptitiously asked if I was available for an opportunity and then, and, and never really told me what the opportunity was until later, um, but it turned out that that opportunity would have been to be the on-camera uh, presence introducing um, iCloud basically to 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 the world and explaining people what the, to people what that meant. And the reason that they chose to not do that is that I had already been in that role for like a few other startups, and they didn't want to be seen as following along. Wow, which made total sense. That does make sense because you know you would be essentially representing. Apple and and you can't be representing a million different places at the same time. Um, yeah, you know, and that's something I wanted to talk about too because when you place yourself in these ads, uh, speaking about these, you know, apps and products and companies, you are kind of in a way saying that you're representing them. You're sort of co-signing their, you know, the 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 greatness of their particular product. Sure. Is there ever a problem? I mean, it sounds like there is with Apple, but other than that, has there been problems along the way where people are like, listen, I want to use you, I like you, but you, if I'm going to hire you, you can't talk about X, you can't talk about Y. Do you ever get limited in those ways? Talk about X and Y within the context of their product or brand? So like if you were going to be one brand's spokesperson, are there limitations mm-hmm. that you can't then go and work on another brand, competing brand? Yeah, but that's not uncommon for talent spokespeople in general. You know, like the the T Mobile or the like the progressive progressive flow can't go and you know contractually she can't go and work with another insurance company. Um, the only real significant case of that I think is one year I did a T Mobile thing, um, and it was only for it was a commercial that was going to be shown at a live event with the founder. 
um, uh, on stage and introducing some, I forget even what the product was. I, it wasn't something um, Sandwich did. It was just I was hired as the talent. Um, and in my contract, I wasn't, I was, you know, not permitted to go and work with another telecom company or, you know, mobile carrier company for a year or something like that, mm-hmm. which is fine. You know, the, the, they, they make it worth your while um, in, in the contractual terms. For everything else, it's basically a handshake kind of an agreement because um, I, I know that if, if I'm out there representing one brand, and then I'm <laughs> then suddenly representing a competing brand, then that not only devalues my own uh, credibility, it de- devalues both of the, the brands themselves. So it's it's kind of a, a tacit understanding that everybody has. But I mean, that's just when I'm on my own on camera presence. I think as a creative studio, we can do mostly what whatever work we need to do. What do you think the appeal is to you on camera? in the type of personality that you're putting out there because it's very different mm-hmm. than a traditional spokesperson. Yeah, honestly, it's just weird. I think I just, um, I represented at a very specific time in culture, I represented an antithesis to the the broadcast appropriate, you know, the, the aesthetic. And I think that that's what it was... It was really welcomed at the time to see people on camera who wouldn't necessarily be on camera before um, because they didn't fit the the, the shape and style. Um, and I think that was great. And I, I think that my own sort of persona or my on-camera presence hopefully had an impact on other brands and other agencies being comfortable with casting non-conforming, you know, people that would, 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 would and, I, and I think that that did happen, whether I was a part of it or not, um, that is the zeitgeist that happened. Um, I don't think I'm the best person to be on camera anymore. I'm, I'm a nerdy dad-ish white guy, and my time is kind of over, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I think let other people have, a, have, have the stage now, and I'm super excited about that. I still like doing it, but it's not like I'm clamoring for the old, the salad days when, you know, ever where I got to be the tech startup whisperer guy. I don't, I don't need that anymore. Well, I think what you also did is you ushered in this new type of storytelling that was just simple. Just tell someone how to use the damn app. Like all, that's all I want to know is how do I use this thing? And right. You know, I can tell you from my perspective, owning a production company in in Boston, many times clients would be like, you know, I'd say, you know, do you have any things that you've been watching? Do you have any references that you really like, the styles that you like? Sandwich stuff was popping up all the time. They're like, we love Mm -hmm. this because it just tells you what's going on. And I think that sometimes, I think ad agencies sometimes and just creative people in general can sometimes get bogged down by trying to make something so unique and so different and so big sometimes that you lose track of what the video is actually supposed to do. And I think that mm. y- you guys have been able to really do that in a creative and interesting way. Um, yeah, I think it's just by paring it down and not trying to embellish too much. And I mean, I came up in, I came up in the world of commercials in a time where there was so much sameness. Um, it was, 2000, 2001, where I started, where I graduated from film school, I started working around advertising and I was actually like a vault manager at a commercial production company. So I saw reels come through all day long and they were just, they were reels from directors all over the world and they were all just young hip directors doing Gatorade and, um, you know, car and kids and what whatever it was of the t- t- telecom lot of lotto commercials for some reason and they all had a sameness to them they were all shot with the same lenses they all had the same style of light they were shot on film back then <laughs> still and they all had that ver- that same texture and it was so discouraging to me as uh, somebody who was interested in commercials as a f- form of communication rather than as a form of art, because I felt that they just weren't very good at selling products. You know, they just weren't, they were too, they were too, um, 
swept up in their own artisanship. Yeah, they were too. It was it was more about metaphor and filmmaking in a thirty second format than it was about actually educating people or consumers or addressing people as though they're worthy of being you know taught something and i never wanted to be that you never i never wanted to be one of those commercials that you know it's a cliche but one of those commercials where you watch the whole damn thing and then you don't know what the damn thing is about i don't even know what that damn thing was about i never wanted to do those kind of commercials <laughs> even though they win awards whatever awards are for awards are nonsense <laughs> the, well <laughs> I, I think you said something interesting there about the goal of the spot being to convey information versus like this big cinematic masterpiece. Um, yeah. Has that been a philosophy of yours from the beginning? Oh, absolutely. It's when even, go, I mean, going back to Birdhouse, my own app, it was like, okay, what was what was the goal of that video? It was like, if we just put an app on the app store and say, this is for saving drafts for your tweets on Twitter so you can work on them and, you know, make them better, people are going to go, that's stupid. I don't understand that. Well, so you need to take them through the narrative of what is it like to have an idea, jot it down, not just spray it out into the internet right away, but actually think about it and think about, is there an opportunity to make this better and sort of represent yourself a little bit, like marginally more effectively? And then you, you, you sort of, so over the course of that, whatever 90 second video it's me as my character sort of interrupting myself cuz i just thought of a of a tweak i could do on the the on the on the tweet that i thought of you take somebody through that story and that emotional um in in, in involvement in the or investment in the in the in the thing the output of the thing itself they're going to understand it a little bit better um and so it was just like it wasn't about being funny it wasn't about being flashy it wasn't about driving through and pulling out that that response, you know, or getting people to hit the buy button. It was only making sure that they understand why it exists. And that was the only thing I wanted to do. And that's been the core principle of everything that Sandwich does since the beginning. Did you work in the film industry at all before you started Sandwich? I did. Um, so I graduated from... Uh, NYU in 2000, I came out, it was essentially an art school. They don't necessarily prepare you to be a tradesperson um, unless you sort of seek that out yourself and you really dig into the gear. I mean, I did a lot of sound mixing when I was in, uh, when I was in film school because that was sort of the thing that I could do to get onto sets with my friends and you know, make sure, have, be helpful in some way. Cause I wasn't a DP. I wasn't, um, a producer, certainly not. Um, so that was how I, I was helpful. And then after school, I had always known how to edit as well. You know, like I was, um, at, you know, I was in film school when they were still shooting on 16 millimeter, you know, s shooting projects on 16 millimeter digital cinema wasn't really yet a thing. And even DV hadn't really come to fruition yet in film school. Um, so I like in, so I shot my junior level film and I had 16 millimeter film. I had it, you know, telecined to digital t or to a uh, beta SP. And then I, um, I wanted to, I knew that I needed to get my edits back to film somehow. There was no guidebook for doing that. So I basically figured out my own method of um, logging time code and cutting in, I guess, Premiere at the time. Cutting in Premiere, no, cutting maybe in Final Cut, early Final Cut, and then matching that time code back to the, to the original negative. And I basically just came up with this whole, um, this whole sort of matchback process on my own because nobody else at the school was doing that. And then it worked. And I thought, oh, maybe, maybe there's something here. You know, like the technology of filmmaking has a lot to a, 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 a long way to go. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of opportunity here. So I was always interested in the tools themselves. 
it was a natural natural progression. After I graduated, I came back out after working as a vault manager and staff editor at that company. I came back came back back out to Southern California, where I'm from, and I immediately, just by chance, found myself working in post product or uh, visual effects on a movie, on a Warner Brothers movie, and I learned that there was like opportunity to use my skills, you know, as a sort of like the the marriage of technology and filmmaking, because that is exactly where visual effects lies. Um, and I ended up working in visual effects for the next six years and just learning a ton about how tech is used to make good old fashioned films and commercials. And it was like the perfect onboarding to a world in which I would be prepared to, to sort of run my own show. Yeah. And when you began, was it just you or when you were hiring freelancers or how did it start for you? Yeah, it was absolutely just me. So after I, I, I worked for a visual effects facility for six years, learned a ton, decided I'd hit a ceiling and I jumped off and I was actually more um, interested in the tech world at that point. So that's when I really thought um, I was going to be an app developer. I just thought I was going to go into the software game. I didn't have what it takes to be a director any, you know, as I had initially conceived of it. Why so do you I was think that? Be, uh, what, what was your initial initial conception of what a director is? Oh, it's such a good question. Um, so we, uh, uh, I think that anybody who goes into our business and sort of wants to be a director has this notion that you have a vision, it's going to be pretty easy to sell people on your vision. All you have to do is put the camera, put the lens in the right places and put, tell the people what to do. Well, that takes a lot of confidence to do it. And especially when, as you start to become aware of all of the process involved, all of the the just the stuff, the logistics, the big toys, mostly the people. And if you're somebody who's relatively introverted and you don't have a lot of confidence to begin with, but like me, I was on set um, as soon as my career started. I was on set and around directors a lot, and I would see how much confidence they had. Sort of just like that brazen, like early 2000s, like I can do anything. The Brett Ratner style of you know filmmaking, which is just like – Let's just shoot it. I'm just going to do it. Like, go over there. Get me that. I'm, let's just make this happen. I don't have time to wait anymore. And that's not my style. And that's nor should that be anybody's style. But just I thought that that, that was um, – and luckily it's, you know, there's less of that these days in the age of accountability. So because that was not my style and that was the style of most of the directors I saw working – I just thought, okay, that is not my chosen. That's not my career trajectory. So yeah. I got to figure out what else it what else it could be. And the world of tech or the world of software specifically felt like it was a way for me to exercise my creative directing skills in service of an end product, um, which I really enjoyed doing. But it wasn't until <laughs> like that birdhouse video where, or you know, the the first few um, of my projects for Sandwich that. Um, I, I sort of realized that uh, I can be responsible for the telling of these stories in a way that is somewhat direct, director-ish. And wait a second, am I a director now? Is that, I can, it says so on the call sheet. Can I be a director? I guess I'm a director. So that just sort of happened accidentally because it turned out it was, it was just getting the little bit of experience that I was so afraid of in the beginning to turn me into somebody who was, who was sort of like confident enough to take those steps by myself. I think a lot of that confidence you talk about too is the ability to speak with clients and get them yeah. on board. I mean, a lot of the job of a director is before cameras roll at all, just getting people on board, getting people to unify a vision. And I'd love to talk yeah. to you about your process working with clients. Um, yeah. Can you walk us through that? Sure. I've really come to love working with clients. And I there was a point probably like in the first third of sound in the, of the the life of sandwich where that was not the case. And I considered <laughs> clients as the sort of necessarily necessary evil <clears throat> to do to the work that we do. No, I actually like I went and did a talk. This is most most ill advised, really terrible talk that I've ever done. Um and the title of the talk was Clients Are the Worst. It was not a smart. It was not a smart thing oh to do. Oh my god! There were what like was it about? There were, 
<laughs> it was it was it was about <laughs> what was it about? It was mostly about all of the different examples and ways that clients can get in the way of the creative process going well. That's a great topic though. I mean it is, but it's like you got to consider your audience. <laughs> um if your audience is like people like us that just need a safe space to commiserate, <laughs> then that's great. Let's do it. Let's talk about our clients. Let's let's um, let's shit talk our clients all day long. It's really fun. Um, but um, this in, this incredible design and branding founder, like a, a, a founder of a design and branding agency, a few, that I met a few years ago in Iceland. He he told me that there is an art to doing what you do with clients. That is, you you need like jujitsu. You can't let it work against you. You have to let it work with you. Mm. And if you can sort of learn to do that, then you can make even better stuff than you would have without them. Not that I'm amazing at it. Sometimes I get furious with my clients, and some, sometimes I just push back the wrong ways. But the pushback used to be hard. It was like ego based. It was it was. It was immature. You know, I, I told a client on the phone once when they, so we used to tell you, everybody in our business knows the temp love, like the music temp love prop problem where you put a temp track in the edit. They fall in love with the temp yep. <laughs> music. When you go to put the final music in there, they're in love with the temp. You Nothing you can do can disabuse them of the notion that that temp was just temp. Um, so we put some temp music in this spot. Meanwhile, I was working with a composer to make a real piece of music that was, and was your shaped. T- was your temp music like an actual song or was it something you found off like a stock site? No, it was library music. You know, yeah. um, it's very rare that we'll use anything that's really, I'll come back to that in a second. Yeah. But, um, um, so basically, like I worked on, with a composer on making a track specifically shaped um, for the for the commercial we were making, I presented it, and they said, "Hmm, we like the other one more." Oh. And they had been so lovely to work with prior to this, so I thought that I had earned this right to sort of um, uh, register my, um, my, you know, my opinion in in, a, in an aggressive way. And I literally said, um, "You hired me to." Uh, exercise my own taste, not your taste, and they did not like that. And we did not work together again. It was it was like the way I said it what was really rude. And I what mean, they, they said say? it was like, oh, that's not cool. <laughs> no, we're wow. your client. We can't. You can't say that. And uh, they were absolutely right. And I think part of maturity is like learning what. You know, that's another topic. But going back to what 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 you said, what. Um, Actually, wait. What was your what was your question? What was your... Oh, about the music? Because I had two in my yeah. Oh, I just was curious you, you, if you would use because sometimes people will put in like you know a, a real song, just like a regular popular right, song, right, 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 right. And that is which like is the, the worst thing you death. can do to yourself. I know it's a yeah. nightmare. Yeah, because because why? Because it makes because it creates the illusion <laughs> that your piece is has probably a hundred times more production value than it, than it actually does. There's nothing you can put a, a, you know, you can put a Beatles song in your commercial and people are going to love it because people love the Beatles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when you take the Beatles away, you're left with a pile of dog shit that doesn't have the Beatles in it. <laughs> yeah. So you don't want to do that to yourself. Um, so yeah, I mean, you, you, you we always want to work with a library track as uh, and a library track that we can license if we absolutely needed to. So was that lesson learned that with that lesson that you got about, you know, mm-hmm. kind of exerting maybe a little bit of kind of brass hubris there a little bit. Um, but yeah, did, was the lesson learned immediately or did you have, was your reaction like the hell's wrong with these people? Like, don't they understand? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I mean, that speaks to personality types. Am I, I don't know. I'm 42 now, and I've learned a lot of lessons over the over the last couple of years. I'm a parent now, so my patience level is, um, you know, a lot a lot better than it used to be. Um, and I th- I think that the most important lesson there to come out of that is really if you're going to be personally offended by 
every decision that somebody outside of yourself makes on the work that you're doing, you're going you're in for a lot of heartache. You're not going to be having fun. You're going to be filled with stress and doubt, self-doubt and like you just like no goodness and sadness. And why subject yourself to that? We should be having fun doing this career that we've chosen for ourselves. So if you can sort of like turn that energy into productivity and like learn to work with it and learn that you can, if you're a little bit clever, you can get what you think is best for the work, but also help your client get to that point as well, then that feels even better than getting what you wanted in the first place. I can't imagine you getting mad. You seem very calm. Unless, you're, unless your anger is just as measured and sort of paced the same as your happiness. <laughs> <laughs> I was sort of like doctor, uh, like, like, like evil supervillain style. Yeah. I mean, there's like, a bit of a Jekyll and It's like, if you just told me you went on a murderous spree, I'd be like, okay. Like, I, I believe it. He's calm enough. He, he could, I guess he could, he could have been the same. <laughs> I mean, for your listeners, I didn't. <laughs> just, I'm not a psychopath. Just to get, we'll, we'll, do, we'll, we'll make a note murder. before the interview so people know. <laughs> yeah, I just put it in the show notes. Adam is not a murderer. Yes. I, I'm pretty even keeled, and I think that that's what you need to be. You need to be under high stress situations, especially on set when you're way behind, it, et cetera. Um, and when things go wrong, you need to not lose your, you, you know, you, you, not, you need to not blow your top and make people feel bad. You need to work together with these people. So like, yeah, I, I feel like it's just not worth it to get angry all the time. Um, do I get angry? Sure. Absolutely. Who doesn't? Uh, yeah. and I think we all can learn that lesson too. Like the first time you, the first time anybody like makes a big stink on set and goes crazy and flies off the handle, you immediately feel like an asshole, like right away. And yeah. you're just like, oh, yeah. why did I do that? It's like, oh, I didn't right. mean. So, I mean, you feel it right away because you realize that everyone is just working to make your project come to life. It's like, you know, right. they're helping you look great in front of your clients. So everyone's in the same boat. But I, I sort of derailed you a bit and I want to bring us back to, to the way that you Sorry. work with clients and kind of how it, how it all starts. So a new client comes, you're working with them. I mean, at this point in your career, they kind of, they know you. I'm guessing they have, look, you know, seek you out because they like your work. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But still, what's your process when you work with them? What's the first conversation you have? Um, the most important thing you can do as step one is to let them know that you understand what they're going for. Like you understand just as a, at a very basic level, what is important about the things that they're, that they are spending all of their time working on. Um, if you can understand that, then they know that you're in the same boat. You're all working together. Um, if if you can let them know, sort of by reflecting back to them, what they've sort of given you to work with, and not in a manipulative, salesy way, not by like saying their name three times in each sentence, um, <clears throat> but by saying, what I'm getting from this brief is... These are the the three important things that we want to say to the audience. Tell me where I'm off base or if this sounds like it's pretty correct. And they'll say, yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. Or they'll say, I don't know about the second one. We've had some research that we thought that that's where it was going, but not. it turns out not to be true. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh, that's interesting. That's really insightful. Thanks for telling me that. Okay, And then you just sort of adjust your understanding. You course correct as you go along. But as as quickly as you can get to them trusting that you know what their vision is or what their I, their values are for the van, the band the brand or the product, that trust is going to go a long way. Mm -hmm. um, that trust means that they're not going to be operating from a place of fear when they work with you, because um, that's where the the questioning of the judgment comes in. That's where I don't know about this piece of music. Are you sure that this 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 lead actor is right for this? Um, like I don't I don't know. And there's like a lot of if they're coming from a place of hesitation and insecurity, it's fear based. It's fear based that you don't that you like me as the video creator doesn't know what I'm doing or talking or or they that that I um, I'm coming from a different place than they are from a different um, foundation. So. Yeah, not to sort of belabor it, but as quickly as you can let them know that you understand what they're going for, um, that, that you're going to be serving them and not working against them, 
then uh, that's the best thing that you can do for the creative process going forward. And how do you get that information to begin with? Do you have a certain set of expectations or like paperwork or something that your clients have to fill out so that they can tell you what their vision is? No, and and that kind of process can be fun to do, like that on onboarding uh, client intake process. I know it can be fun to be on the uh, on the client side of it because that's what we did when we worked with our the branding agency we worked with to rebrand Sandwich and to build our website and everything. They gave us like a forty page client intake form, and it was really a joy to fill it out yeah. and dump everything in there. Um, our process in almost every way as a creative studio is far less formalized than that. And it's far more um, intuition based. Um, and we don't work with repeatable systems that much. Um, the repeatable systems are the people, you know, uh, like I know that because of my specific team that I've assembled over the years, our process is going to be repeatable to a high degree of standard um, a high, high degree of qualitative standards because we are the pieces of the system. It's not necessarily the clerical pieces or the set of questions we ask. Um, my favorite way to do a client intake or an intro call with a client is just to have a conversation. And, and, the, and they say, how do we start? And I say, I don't know. Why don't you tell us about the product? And they'll, say, they'll do the elevator pitch or whatever it is they're comfortable with yeah. saying in that sort of unplanned context. I've said context four times on this interview. It's, it's disgraceful. I'm not going to say it anymore. It's disgraceful. <laughs> I was going to say you know, something, I hate, but... <laughs> I hate falling into these traps where you just repeat the same words because it feels like, hey, dude, get a thesaurus. Especially, um, it, it hadn't even been a minute since you said we, we don't employ repeatable systems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Only in certain contexts. <laughs> I didn't even notice it, honestly. <laughs> okay. Um... I mean, I'm somebody who has to use words to explain process all day long, so I find myself falling into the same habits, and, and <laughs> when I do, it's like, ugh, buddy. Anyway, um, yeah, so I really like to have the conversation and, and let it flow in stream in stream of consciousness format um, because every client is different. Uh, every product is different. I mean, that's the fun part about what we do is that you're not working – on the same job or movie or show, whatever, for years, ev you're working on, uh, you know, with a new, like a new puzzle to, to put together, a new challenge to solve on a weekly basis, sometimes on a daily basis. You're getting on phone calls and having to quickly, like, f model your understanding of a new thing on the fly. Yeah. And it's incredibly taxing on the brain, but when you start to build those muscles, it's really awesome. Now, this is great when you have an opportunity to talk to your client about their vision and all that. But in mm -hmm. some situations, like if you're pitching against other companies and you don't necessarily yeah. have the opportunity to get in depth with the client, how, yeah. are you, how are you getting the information necessary to come up with a plan to, you know, basically pitch to a client? Right. Oh, God, it it's, can be so vulnerable. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, vulnerable position to be in where you feel like you don't know and you don't want to break protocol by asking. And it sucks. I'm just like, that's the thing that I'm never going to, I, I don't think I'll, I'll, I'll um, like change my opinion about is pitching in a, in a multiple bid situation is always going to suck. I know. I hate you that. Al you always have the, the, they have the upper hand. Often you're going in on a spec you know, situation where you're not getting paid to do an enormous amount of creative work. Um, so, I mean, what you can do is you can take your best guess and you can put in the effort and you can show some ingenuity in how you got to there. Um, you can put some thought into it that maybe nobody else has, has, has exhibited. I mean, really like think about it in a different way. Um, the re the really the answer is there are, there's no good answer there's yeah. no two clients that are the same they're not looking for the same thing you don't know who else the agent who who the other agencies are there's been there have been like two situation two pitch, pitch situations where i've had an inside person sort of um secretly 
uh, helping me out with information. Like nice. this is who else they're t- they're talking to. Oh, it felt very cagey to do it, but it was very helpful. Um, and it was when things came up w- that were like, um, just so you know, on the sly, this is what they're afraid of happening. Mm. And then you can sort of adjust your pitch to say, these are the ways that we're going to, um, you know, address those fears. Um, whether they know that, that you, that you've been tipped off is another question, but it just puts you into the, like the sort of unique mindset or psychology of on the client side, which is that they have all these fears. And, um, I don't know, some agencies are really good at getting ahead of those fears and the ways that they do that is like backing it up with a lot of like, um, uh, what do they call it? Case studies. Yeah. You know, put a lot of case studies in the deck about performance and yada, yada, yada. That's not my cup of tea for necessarily. Um, we don't track the performance of a lot of this, the work that we do. We just sort of anecdotally know that it works well, especially if our clients come back to us and we've done multiple campaigns with the same client. But we don't like to overload our presentations or our pitches with these are the numbers we're, you're going to hit. And like this is the performance and the CPMs you're going to expect, the, the metrics kind of stuff. I don't like that to be a part of our creative decision making. So I don't want to misrepresent that it's taking more space in our creative process than it, than it would be. What I want to do is like load up the deck with really innovative thinking, strategic thinking about the challenge that we're being asked to solve. Mm. And I mean, step one of a deck that does that is, um, you know, ask those questions and answer them. You know, what is it that you, your audience needs to know? We think it's these things. Mm. Um, and here's how we're going to tell a story in that way. Yeah. So if you can do that, I think you're, you're ahead of the game. I've had that fail miserably. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. And sometimes, and when that happens, you got to just take these, take, take the attitude that it's them is not you. You know, it's like, you couldn't have known you did the best you could. Yep. Yep. You'll get the next one. How do you, one of the, one of the more vulnerable conversations that, you know, people have with their clients is about budget. And I'd love to know sure. how you approach the budget conversation. I got to say, that's one mm-hmm. of the biggest questions I get. Um, on this show, whenever we have conversations with production company owners, or like if I'm going out and doing a speech or something about starting a production company, it's always, how do I talk to my clients about budget? What's your answer? So tricky. Um, I mean, you want to know what you're worth in the market, obviously, and you want to try to not do work for less than that. You got to be real realistic about it. Um, but I mean, the answer is pretty consistently going to be that you're going to start by doing projects for far less than you should be. Eventually, you're incrementally going to build up. So you're doing a project for about what your market value is. And then hopefully you get to the point where you're um, you're offering such a, a premium product that you're able to get higher than market value. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, that's sort of the model, but you got to be sort of comfortable operating at you know, a quote unquote loss for a little bit. Yeah. I don't say, I don't think you want to do work for free. I don't like, I, I saw a YouTube video popped up in my feed. Um, I've been watching a lot of video creator YouTube channels these days. Cause you know, it's, I'm in a new, in, in a new headspace about that stuff. But um, I saw somebody say, listen, what you want to do is do a lot of free work for for a while, you know, and just get out there, grow your network. And and I think, yeah, I guess so if you're in a place where you don't need to put food on the table, sure, I guess that's a way to start. But you don't want to do that for very long. You want to be very realistic about you know, what, what the market opportunity is and see how quickly you can capture that. Be comfortable operating a loss at a loss, like, like, like I said, but really... The, the calculus is how quickly can you start paying the people that are helping you to make your projects, right? Yeah. Fine. Take a loss for yourself. Do it for zero dollars because you love it. And eventually you're going to be the one reaping the rewards of being, a, of, of being a, of an independent business owner. But you don't want to ask people, you don't want to ask people to, to get on that um, ship with you. You don't want, you don't want to ask people to work for free. Um, 
because they're going to get bored of it. You yeah. know, if it's a passion project, if it's a short film, sure, do it for pizza. But if it if it's a commercial client, yeah, make sure that you can pay somebody at the very least minimum wage. So you've mm-hmm. convinced them and you've shown them that you understand their needs. Mm-hmm. How do you then turn that information into a spot, a commercial? Yeah, well, you you present them with a concept in a treatment form. And it doesn't, it's usually not a script at that point. It's sort of like it's mood board or, um, you know, some prose about what the story could be, the shape it could take. And they're going to ask you questions because it's not all there on the page. And yeah. you answer those questions well. And they say, yeah, we like it, you know, hopefully. Sometimes they say, Let, no, <laughs> let's try again. <laughs> Sometimes you present two or three, you know, that's been our model often these days, if, especially if they ask for it, you, you present three ideas and then they could easily come back to you with, we love number two, let's go in that direction. Or we like elements of number three and this one thing you did in number one. Hmm. So retool it. Uh, and then when you sort of like coalesce around a concept, then really it's time. To, then the client says, okay, now what happens next? <laughs> you say, I'm sure you're familiar with that question. Yep. Where do we go from here? Yeah. Because they don't know. They don't own a video company like you do. Um, and you say, okay, well, now we're going to go back into the shed and we're going to talk about what are the important elements of the script. And uh, usually at this point, our head writer, Josh, touches every script that we do. He's just like a brilliant, incredible writer who's been with me almost since the beginning. Um, And his work ethic is crazy. And he'll just, he's a very quiet guy, funny as hell, but in like a quiet funny. He usually won't speak up that much during creative meetings. He'll just absorb everything. He'll go into his shed, his proverbial shed. He'll come out with a beautiful script that me- needs like very little adjustment. <laughs> and then we, we sort of, um, or sometimes a lot of adjustment, you know, he's, uh, and that, that can be a fun part of the process too, is um, editing the script as you go. You know, the, the editorial process is just creative, uh, just as creative as the authorial process. You get to this, the script to a good place and then you present it to the client and you say, this is a, because many, many of them have never read a script before. You say, this is a blueprint for what your video is going to be like or your commercial. It has all of the elements there on paper so that everybody that we work with in production is going to know what resources they need. But don't assume that you're going to know exactly what the directorial treatment is going to be from this script itself. That's not its purpose. Um, And usually they, they just, you know, the client's involvement at that point is that they can come in and make their fine tuning and their adjustments about certain languaging that you use that maybe isn't quite right, certain terminology, or even certain strategic stuff. Like we noticed you put this, you made this character an older woman. We find that our target audience is the, between the ages of 11 and 13. So let's not make that an, an older woman. And you'll be like, oh, okay, that's good to know. Thanks for telling us. And then you, you rewrite the script and, and then eventually the script gets locked and you go into production, you start casting locations, all that stuff. You now, do you, does Sandwich operate as a, a creative agency or simply a production company? And what I mean by that is like, are you also doing ad buys and market research and all that stuff? No, we're not a media, like, so we think of that as the media agency. Mm -hmm. Um, The creative agency is absolutely doing the creative legwork and some of the strategic legwork sometimes and production and post, obviously. But the, the, the ad buys, that's all the realm of the media agencies. And we have a lot of, you know, a few different really solid partners that we work with on the media side who often will be our source of inbound work. Yeah. um, You know, client work. Um, cause they're working with these clients and sometimes billing millions of dollars for the client to get something on the air in the strategically perfect times. They want to be armed with the best assets. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, the media, if you can, if you can sort of, uh, pal, pal up with some, with some media partners, um, in your area or, or whatever, 
um, they can be tremendous now, you know, way to, to build that network that brings you inbound clients. Yeah. I think that's a really good, but we don't do any of that. Yeah, it really is. So when you're making the decisions about who's your audience, um, -hmm. and you're developing, you know, you're developing, uh, storylines and scripts based on some sort of metrics, where are those coming from? Um, most often it's the internal marketing departments at our at our clients. You okay. know, the, the clients that we're working with now are big enough that they have a marketing team. Yep. Early on, that wasn't the case. We were working with a lot of early stage startups that maybe had one person doing marketing. Yeah. And zero, you know, real user research to speak of. And that's a, it's a different game now. We're working with seasoned, sort of matured, um, later stage companies. They have fully built out marketing teams that have all the data because that is the job that they have to do. And they'll tell us sort of like what the what the data is and where we, how we can use that as a starting point for the, building out the creative strategy. Um, sometimes they'll give you a brief this big, and then you sort of like th- you say thank you, and you put it in a drawer. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you know, because that's not what makes good creative. Yeah. But you just kind of want to be aware of what of 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 what some of the data is, or really just how they understand their market in a way that you po- can't possibly understand it. I, I want to talk about um, mistakes that you've made in your career. You've been in business for quite a while. I'm sure there's been a few. Um, can you point to any that maybe we can kind of use and learn from? Yeah, I think a lot of the mistakes can have to do, have something to do with the people that you're work like that you're involving in your process, um, making wildly uninformed uh, uh, wildly uninformed assumptions about the the value that somebody is going to add to your process without really having much evidence. I think I've operated on intuition a little bit too much sometimes. Um, and I'm, you know, like I'll be lying in bed and suddenly my eyes open wide and I say, I've got it. I have to hire this person in order to serve this purpose because that's going to end up solving this problem. You, sometimes when I operate with that style of thinking, of thinking that A is going to go to B is going to go to C, then I'm setting myself up for failure. Mm. You can't really know. Um, I think that the correction to that mistake is seek out good people. Be available to find good people, talented people, smart people, but most most importantly, good people. Um and then start thinking about what they, what that person can uh, bring to your process and your company. Um, Because that's been some of my greatest success is um, finding somebody that I really, really like and I find very valuable um, in a very unique way, not exactly knowing what they're going to be doing quite yet, bringing them in and then sort of like fostering an environment where they can sort of discover the process. And what has happened multiple times is that you end up um, finding a solution to a problem that you didn't even know you had. Um, and you let that person sort of be a part of the the growth of their own um, capacity mm. within your operation. I think that's a really fun thing to do. Um, I think that a mistake that some probably like greener business owners make is thinking that in order to be in business, you have to hire this person, this person, this person. You have to have those sort of like pillars um, in your operation and then everything is going to work out. And I think um, that's a sort of weird way to think about it. I think you sort of, sort of operate as assuming that you got to do everything yourself a little bit first in order to know what um, you shouldn't be doing anymore. Mm. And then you can go and find the person to be doing that thing that, that better than you can. Do you have a favorite project you've worked on? Yeah, um, I do. I think it's the one that we did for the midterms um, 
And it's not a client project. It's something that, well, I mean, like my two favorite projects that we've done actually are the projects that we self-funded and did in, in house, um, which the, 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 the one I was going to say is in the midterms in 2018, we made a video, the whole team sort of pitched in and did it like low budget to encourage people to come in and vote. Um, and the reason I, I like it, not as like an outlier, but because it represents the work, the creative work that we do uh, uniquely well at Sandwich is um, that we figure out the proper way to like take an idea or a process or a platform or a tool and we model it so that people can understand it. And we, 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 um, we then tr- translate that modeling into a story so that people can watch the model in real in real time and sort of appreciate why they can project themselves onto that model. Mm. And it was in the case of the vote video, it's, it's called how to vote. Literally it's, it's like the framework is as a technology demonstration for the voting process, which is essentially like how to democracy, you know, it's like why it's all, it's, it's, it's a, it's a how to video that's secretly a, everything is going bad and we got to fix this guys. And, um, we worked with a really incredibly talented comedian, um, uh, as the on-camera talent, um, Demi Edijuibe. And we, we got a local polling place that is also a church in my neighborhood to sort of donate the space as a location. And I, I thought that like, okay, part of the barrier to young people being comfortable with going out and voting is they don't know what to expect and they think it's going to be scary and they think it's going to be unfamiliar. People are going to ask like a bunch of questions. They're going to have to fill out a bunch of forms. And all we have to do is disabuse all of that preconception. We got to show them from start to finish how easy and delightful it can be. And so we take our hero character, Demi, and he's basically like, I'm here to vote. Let's do this. He walks through the whole process. It's really funny and charming. Um, I have a cameo in it as the poll volunteer, which I really should be doing this year. I'm going to look into that. Um, And then, uh, you know, it got shared a lot. You know, we put it out for the midterms and it got shared a lot. And if it changed even one person's mind, uh, one young person's mind and made them a little bit more comfortable with going to the polling place and going through the process because they'd seen it represented well in, in video form, then it did its job. That was awesome. And to me, that was just like a baby little sandwich video. Yeah. In our last couple of minutes, I just want to talk about how things have changed for you during COVID-19. How are you approaching production now? Yeah, I mean, it's such a long conversation. And I listened to your interview with Jason LaCorey. Yeah. Um, Have you worked with him? No, no, I wasn't familiar with him, but it was so familiar, all the things that he was talking about, because we we are doing a lot of those same things. Yeah. Very early on, we can't, we sort of like, on day one of quarantine, I had this idea that we've worked with Slack in the past. We did like a We did a video about how our team uses Slack when Slack was first launched. Um, And it was sort of a mockumentary style thing. And it was in, to this day, it's one of the pieces on our portfolio that people reference the most. And so I realized on day one of of our quarantine, we're going to be using Slack a lot to just keep being a team, but also keep being a community. So I came up with this idea to make a video telling the story for Slack about how our team is going to be using Slack. And what if we could make this video largely remotely working from home using Slack? Um, So it was really just a clever sort of meta conceptual piece that I pitched to Stuart Butterfield, um, the founder of Slack, and he signed off on it. And and then we had to figure out how to do it. Because initially the thinking was, we're gonna do this safely with a really, really small crew, tiny crew, and then quarantine is going to be over in a couple of weeks, and then yeah. it'll be fine, right? Um, well, as we sort of started exploring how we're going to do this with a small crew, it became clear we can't do this with any crew. We got to do a zero crew shoot, shoot. So we basically came up with this idea of putting a package together 
with um, around a very basic set of gear, but professional gear of camera lights and sound package. And we dropped that gear. We, first of all, we trained everybody remotely on this gear. Our DP Lowell Meyer made a set of like a series of videos in which he demonstrated it using every piece of the gear and the software, et cetera. We made everybody who was going to be on camera use this, uh, watch these, these training videos and learn the gear. Then one by one over the course of five days, we dropped the gear off at each person's house and we remotely using Zoom, of course, we talked them through the whole setup. And there's, you know, there's a whole behind the scenes documentary about this process. And anyway, it's, and it's making, awesome. You guys definitely should watch oh. it and we'll put it in the show notes. It's really entertaining and a good lesson in how to do remote production. Oh, it was super fun. And I'm so glad we ended up with that artifact as an instructive piece for other video people t- to be using. Um, a lot of people are doing it now. You know, there's nothing, you you know, h- highly uh, proprietary about it. But we were just like, it was so exciting to jump on it so quickly and be able to figure out that challenge so quickly and have it turn out well. And then while during that process, we, we realized, oh, this is repeatable. We could keep doing this because we don't know how long quarantine is going to go on and we got to keep making work for clients. So we branded it Lunchbox and we figured out all the formal, you know, systems. Basically we upgraded some of our tools um, and, you know, built up the package. And that's been really fun too, because now I get to be obsessed with gear. And, um, and since then we've done four, tomorrow will be the fifth one, actually sixth uh, piece of client work using remote production methods in this new world. And, you know, there, it, our business is, is continuing. We have, we're, otherwise, we'd be destitute. Yeah. If we weren't trying to, if we weren't innovating our way out of this problem, uh, of this very unique challenge, um, we'd be goners. But, I mean, I think that that's the silver lining is, yeah, we're presented with a problem, all of us, universally. And, um, and, and, and if you can figure it out, how to make this happen, then you're going to be in a good place. Can you tell us the kit you send out? Sure, absolutely. It's real easy. Um, so the core of it is a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. Um, uh, the, um, you know, nice, man, you know, heavy-duty Manfrotto sticks. Um, we've got a couple of light mats and a couple, uh, you know, LED, you know, big LED lights and diffusion and whatnot. Um, some C stands, some light uh, light panels, which are the, you know, the square LED yep. um, color adjustable lights, um, and st- some stands for those. Um, MKH four sixteen Sennheiser, sh- you know, shotgun mic, um, boom pole um, on a stand with a boom pole mount. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the assortment of cables and whatnot. Um, the, the kit goes out with a MacBook running team viewer so we can remotely do data management. Um, everything's set up with zoom. Um, we, uh, we an a 10 mini pro black magic, a 10 mini pro, um, really for converting the black magic input into the computer and allowing for remote camera control, mm-hmm. um, through the black magic software. Um, what else? Some, some good glass. Um, you know, various like little adapters and things and, yeah, you know, it's pretty dialed in. So the team viewer allows you to control the computer and that allows you to do the remote capture because the, the application that's on the computer, you can control through team viewer. So we, we kind of do the same thing where we have, um, we send out our, our computers and cameras and like, Basically, as long as the talent can just open up a computer and connect it to the internet, they don't have to deal with any of the software. It's like, it's, we have full control of it. So I think we have a much more simplistic version of it, but that's because we're shipping it out. We're not like dropping yeah. it at people's homes. Maybe you are too, I'm not right. sure, but we've had to make a kit so contained, it's like all within one box. Right. No, we're doing, because we're doing, we're trying to replicate like commercial level, yeah. you know, full production quality. Um, as best as we can, so we're we're not able to minimize it as much as we'd like, and also all of our talent is local 
Um, there you go. So we're, we can just we can drive it around um, safely. Oh, and then the the sound um, is the Zoom H6 recorder, and that is like that's the last big piece of the puzzle is um, uh, you know remotely managing sound. I know that Jason mentioned this. So there's like s- some sound mixer technology that will allow you to um, remotely administer it and like you know ride your levels and start and stop recording everything. If we could add that to our kit, I don't. It would. It would game. It would change the game. Honestly, I just use GarageBand. That's it. I can look yeah. at my meters. I can watch it. I can control the input. Um, oh, you mean sort of record directly to the hard drive? Yep, I go right to oh, the see. hard drive. Um, and yeah. and control it the same way I'm controlling the um the camera app. Just watching it. I mean, it's not perfect. Nothing's going to be as good as having an actual crew on set, obviously. But it's like right. You know, sometimes you just can't do it. And this is kind of a right. cool, innovative way. And it's exciting to solve this problem. It's been really oh, fun sure. trying to figure it out. And I could tell it's the same for you because watching your behind the scenes, it's like you can see how like invigorated you guys all are to to solve this problem and do it really, really well. Oh, it's so it's super exciting. We've um and we we our best solution to the problem is sort of the hybrid solution that Jason mentioned, which is like when realizing that we when you can add one or two key people that are that the talent is having is comfortable having there on set with them have that person be setting the sta- setting the lights and stands running the camera checking focus yeah um it's like again it changes the game it just adds like 500% more efficiency to the to the operation as opposed to having the talent to do it themselves yeah but some talent isn't comfortable with that so you you really like you, you got to adjust based on that comfort level and safety concerns. Well, the website to see your work is sandwich.co. And I encourage you guys all to check it out because there's so much good stuff on there. And you're going you're gonna to go through the site and say, oh my God, I've seen that ad. I've seen this ad. Mm-hmm. I've seen that ad. It'll be familiar to you. And, um, mm-hmm. and for great reason, because the quality of the ads is great. The storytelling is really good. Uh, you guys, like I said at the beginning, are truly an inspiration for me, and I know many people listening out there. What is next for Sandwich? Where are you guys going from here? Um, we are we're like we're building a site in our office, and like uh, we're going into virtual production in a, in a strong way that oh I wasn't. Oh my god! I knew expecting. it. I knew it. <laughs> I knew that was going to come. So many people are no, talking I, about this, and it's 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 awesome. I know. Well, it's so exciting. And it didn't click for me until we were like a month into doing remote shoots where we, we, we found that obviously we're limited by the locations of our talent. We're not going out there and scouting, you know, locations from location databases and then going into big houses and shooting commercials there like we used to. Um, so, okay. So if you're limited to, to the locations that your talent has available, but you want more. <laughs> you want more than that. Then what's a different way of doing it? And I mean, like, I it was the it was the zeitgeist. It was everybody was seeing worlds collide in the same way with the Mandalorian and like Matt Workman yep. doing his work and Unreal Engine getting powerful enough and democratized and all you know all of these pieces coming together and it clicked for me and and our DP. Oh wow, we we have the space. We had un, like, you know, in a, in a stroke of bad timing, we had just taken on another office space. We have four units in our building now. Um, we had three, you know, for many years, and now we took a fourth one opened up, and and so we started building out conference rooms and like have this sort of a significantly sized space there. Um, and then I realized. Oh, I could just ha- ask my contractor to build us a seamless psych, and then we could sh- use that as a sh- as a stage, and and we can yeah. do it on our on our own, you know our own our own comfort zone. And so, like right away, I just started gearing up and learning what I could about all of the virtual production process. I've been absorbing YouTube videos. I've been, you know, behind me over there is a gaming PC. Um, and I hate Windows. I cannot abide Windows, but I'm like sort of like struggling through it. And you know, I've got like a Vive tracker and right. So this is a camera, <laughs> you know. This I put the put our little Vive tracker on here. And 
Look at that. Suddenly, I've got a camera camera on my sh- my shoulder, right? This is going to be our our camera in, in a virtual world. Um, there's a lot to do still, but just knowing that this is possible and yeah. that people are actually doing it, and when it's going to be, um, when it when it's going to be like an epical shift is when we do it for a client project the first time, yep, successfully, and then it's I feel like. That's that's like sort of sandwich version 4.0, basically. A hundred percent. I'm with you a hundred percent. Everyone's wondering what's the, what is the next big big evolution and revolution in, in production companies and filmmaking. DSLR was like kind of the last big one. It's virtual yeah. production. It's not 3D, obviously. That went by the wayside. <laughs> it's not necessarily yeah. 8, 12, 800K. It's not that virtual production. Mm-hmm. That's... That, that that's what it is, and Matt Workman is yeah. perf- perfectly positioned to completely control this market and be the go-to. And we're actually going to be having Matt back on the show. He hasn't been on for a few oh, years. Um, we had him on for our millionth download episode, which is still on the website. You guys can check it out. But um, we're going to have him back on soon to talk about all that because that is the next. That's the frontier that we all are going to be approaching for sure. Yeah, and you know what I like about it at this point is it's such an untapped frontier it's 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 that most of the people like the tool builders the real innovators in the space they're doing it sort of with the language still with the language of sort of um video game aesthetic and music video aesthetic and i see that i see that as an opportunity to work in my aesthetic because i don't really like those other aesthetics i don't want to make i don't want to be like Okay, what's the the next cool app that my clients are working on? And then okay, drop an ogre in here, and then like a uh, you know a Lara Croft look alike in here, and those are our characters demonstrating. Yeah. From. That's not what I want to do, and I don't want to do flashy laser light light beams and like I don't want to lean into have to lean into this video game aesthetic that has been mapped out in this space for for so long. I want to figure out how to bring it into my space. That's yeah. the fun part. A hundred percent. It's like, I don't need, I don't need it to be this fantastical, you know, crazy environment that's unrealistic. I need it to be like a house. <laughs> like I need someone sitting right. in a living room. That's what I need. Right. Um, yeah. No, this is cool. And a fascinating conversation. And really, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all this information. A lot of people would not want to just divulge all this information out there, especially people that run production companies. You can, you know, sometimes you can mm. become a little protective of your plans and, and process, but you guys have always been really yeah. good about putting it oh, all wait, out Did there. I screw up? Should I take it all back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. What did no, I do? I, I like that no, you just I'm coming good. out there. I, and... I mean, yeah, you got to share it. You, we got to we, we got to be a community because we're all going to use the tools differently. We're all going to take all that knowledge and do different things with it. Nobody's going to be able to reproduce what I do, and nobody's going to be able to reproduce what you do. That's the way that that it, that it works. Well, some of my stuff they will. <laughs> it's not all great, Adam. <laughs> oh well, it's not all. Yeah, I mean, not. A, we do what we we do what we can. Exactly. Oh my God! All right. Well, Adam Lissagor, uh, thank you so much for being on Go Creative Show Sandwich Co to check out Adam and his work. Anything else you want to plug? Instagrams, Twitters, anything like that? No. Go vote. There you go. There you go. The more important issue. Adam, thank you so much for being on Go Creative Show. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a blast. A huge thank you to Adam Lissagor for coming on and sharing his experiences. It's like, I am so inspired by his company. Uh, and I have been since they first started, you know, a few years back. Like, it's just amazing what these guys can do. And I hope you were inspired from the interview as well. So please let us know in the feedback on our website, wherever you're watching or listening to this, let us know what you thought of the show. And of course, let us know and let Adam know that you loved his appearance on the show. That makes a huge difference. I also want to thank our producer, Connor Crosby, for putting all of this together behind the scenes. You can find him at ignitionvisuals.com. And of course, Matt Russell and his team over at gainstructure.com. They mix and they master and they make the show sound so good. Believe me, it is not me making the show sound good. It's them. And um, of course, we want to thank those guys. You can find them at gainstructure.com. Now, all things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. Subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app. Um, Subscribe to us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. 
Again, we're going to be doing a lot on YouTube, so subscribe now if you haven't yet, and you will start seeing Go Creative Show lives. I'm so excited about these. I cannot wait. We're pulling it together, and it's going to be fun. And of course, I want to thank our sponsors, MZ Education for Creatives and Post Lab, Stress-Free Collaboration in Final Cut Pro and Premiere. Please support those that support us so that the show can stay alive. And of course, I want to thank you guys for listening and sharing. It makes a huge difference. And we love you and we thank you for sticking with us all these years. Of course, we'll see you next week on another episode of Go Creative Show, podcast for filmmakers. Filmmakers.